Ecology of Everyday Life, Rethinking the Desire for Nature, by Chaya Heller, published by Black Rose Books, 1999. Acknowledgements If it takes a village to raise a child, it takes several communities to write a book. Writing is indeed, a social process and this book would never have been written without the support and insight of a wide number of wonderful people. I give great thanks to the Institute for Social Ecology for providing a forum in which to develop these ideas since I first arrived there 15 years ago. To Dan Chodorkov who welcomed me into the ISE at such a young age, allowing me to develop my abilities as a teacher, and I thank Peggy Lors and Anastra King for leading me to into the world of feminist theory and practice. I am grateful to Paula Emery, for her wit, wisdom and relentless sense of style and to Claudia Bajiakos, Betsy Chodorkov, Kathy Chodorkov, and Michael Mazenga, whose everyday labors of intelligence and love make the Institute for Social Ecology a much-needed reality. I am grateful to the entire faculty at the ISE who are working to keep revolutionary ideas alive, and I thank Cindy Milstein and Janet Beale for their enduring integrity and commitment to keeping the struggle honest and visionary. I owe many thanks as well to Zoe Irwin who has always made me feel that my ideas were worth getting out into the world. The students in my eco-feminism classes over the years have been central to writing this book. I am deeply appreciative of all of their questions and criticism that have continually challenged me to push my ideas forward. I owe much gratitude to Brian Talker who has been a tremendous source of support and inspiration both as a fellow thinker and as a friend, helping me through this process at difficult times and reminding me of the reasons to keep going. I also thank the wonderful people at the University of Massachusetts Department of Anthropology who have inspired me to venture into unfamiliar and exciting new theoretical waters. Jackie Erlaw, Brooke Thomas, Ralph Fockingham, Art Keen, and Rick Fantasia are just some of the people who have been an invaluable source of support and guidance. I thank Arturo Escobar for his generous support for my work and for making my return to school nothing short of a joy. For reading and making valuable comments on parts of this book, I thank the many women of Northampton who gave their time and attention to this manuscript. Special thanks to Janet Alfs, Sally Belrose, Susan Stinson, Alison Smith, Susan Edelstein, Elena Deutsch, and Hilary Sloyn, to the folks in the Living Room Study Group of 96, I give great thanks to you all, Zoe Irwin, Eric Tonesmere, Tanya Tolchin, Rebecca DeWitt, Jonathan Stevens, and Nancy Lustgarten for receiving my ideas with intelligent criticism and generous enthusiasm, and a special thanks to Bob Spivy for endless moral support, encouragement, and willingness to laugh and listen. Big thanks too, to James Creedon and Morgan Kennedy who speed read their way through the book in, one of, its last incarnations, giving important insights and suggestions. Thanks also to the friends who helped me through the last pangs of producing this manuscript. Thanks to Brian Talker, Cindy Milstein, Peter Stoutenmeyer, and in particular, Greta Gard who painstakingly took care to make sure the book entered the world in good form. I thank Greta for the years of encouragement and wisdom which have motivated and inspired me. Thanks also to Carolyn Merchant for the time and generosity it takes to support the arrival of a new book. Friends and family have given me strength that has made this book possible. I am indebted to Alana Boss Markowitz. Alison Dufresne, and Nancy Bale for decades, of love, humor, and endurance, for being crucial touchstones that make life navigable. I thank Alison Prine for reminding me always of courage and imagination, and of course poetry. Crow and Clove have provided me with years of patience, advice, and wisdom. Hilary Mullins, I thank for being my first feminist buddy and Jamie Morton, I thank for music and a solid first try. To my newer friends in the Valley, Beverly, Bob, and Sam Naidu Spivoy, Nancy Lustgarten, Valija Ivaltz, Lisa Beskin and Robin, Allison Smith, Sally, and Cindy, Susan Stinson, and Elena Deutsch, I thank you all for providing me with sustenance and phone friendship during periods when I could not leave my computer. And to my incredible family thanks to my parents who have patiently supported every page of this journey, my sisters Laura, Carol, and my brother-in-law Jorge who keep me anchored in love and humor from year to year. Thanks to Alan, Judy Jane, and Paul Kronick whom continue to provide generosity and warmth. 
and I wish to express deepest appreciation to Sandra and Dick Smith for providing endless encouragement, insight and support to pursue the work and life I love. Thanks to Steve Chase who first put the bug in my ear, Pavlos Stavropoulos and Ricky Matthews at Aggies who got the ball rolling, and I owe many, many thanks to Demetrius Russopoulos and Linda Batten of Black Rose Books who were able to get the book out into the world. I am most grateful to Murray Bookshin whose relentless vision, bravery and brilliance has blazed a trail upon which I have traveled, and hope to continue to travel, for many years to come. I am reminded daily of my good fortune to have found in Bookshin a mentor, generous and encouraging, who has been willing and able to gently prod me to recognize my own potential to think, write and speak about revolutionary ideas. For this, and for so much more, I will always be indebted. This book would not have been written without Lizzie Donahue, leprechaun extraordinaire, whose love, encouragement, humor, and flair for the absurd, gave me the peace of mind to finally sit down and write. Introduction, Ecology and Desire Ecology is as much about desire as it is about need. While the ecology movement of the 60s addressed the need for clean air and water for survival, it also expressed a popular desire for an improved quality of life. People took to the streets in the 70s to fight nuclear power, but many also took to the land to build ecological communities hoping to enrich their social relationship as well as their ties to the natural world. Ecology addresses two demands, then, one quantitative, the other qualitative. Born out of the call for enough clean water, air, and land to survive, Ecology is also the demand for a particular quality of life worth living. Ecology and the Dialectic of Need and Desire As political protest to ecological degradation, began to wane in the mid-80s, an emphasis on quality of life issues held steady. Enthusiasm for nature-based spirituality as well as for natural foods and medicine, reflected a continuing popular desire for health and meaning associated with ecology. However this emphasis on quality of life has taken on an individualistic tone often expressed through personal changes in lifestyle and consumption habits. If middle-class North Americans feel socially disempowered to ensure the planet's survival, they can at least command the buying power to ensure that their individual lives will be ecologically pleasurable in the short term. In turn, ecology has taken on a romantic dimension. For privileged peoples within industrialized capitalist contexts, there is a tendency to desire a pure or innocent nature that is prior to or outside of society. Such ecological discussion can range from a longing to protect an ideal mother nature, to a yearning to return to a golden age that may have never existed. The growing popularity of wilderness exploration trips on the one hand reflects a genuine wish for a meaningful connection with the rest of nature. But on the other hand, such ventures echo the myth of the romantic hero strutting off into the wilds of nature, turning away from the society he has left behind. More and more, questions of desire upstage questions of need within ecological discussion. Insulated from, and often desensitized to, the immediate effects of ecological breakdown, people of privilege still have sufficient natural resources to survive. However, not everyone is protected from immediate ecological crises. Due to the effects of capitalism, racism, sexism, and state power, most people on the planet are obliged to design a very different ecological agenda. While also sharing the desire for quality of life, most of the world's people are increasingly under pressure to emphasize questions of need and survival in their work for ecological justice. There exists a global division of ecological labor in which, while the poor in the southern hemisphere are forced to work to sustain the viability of life, Addressing questions of access to food, water, and land, many in the North are able to work to establish a quality of life, considering what kind of food to eat, what quality of water to drink, as well as what kind of spiritual or cultural sensibility to embrace. Again, while all people desire a better quality of life, the question of who has the freedom to fulfill these desires is largely informed by global questions of power and privilege. And yet, this division of privilege cannot be reduced to geography. Due to the global nature of advanced capitalism, there is a bit of the North in the South and a bit of the South in the North. Indeed, as the underclass swells within the US and Europe, 
a privileged elite continues to grow within the southern continents as well. Still, despite these complexities, it makes sense to point to this global division, it allows us to acknowledge conditions of inequality under global capitalism that are generally manifested on opposite sides of the equator. In response to this global division of ecological labor, many well-meaning activists suggest that we should eliminate superfluous qualitative questions to focus on issues of survival alone. Concerned with the ecological bottom line, they reduce ecology to quantitative issues of demographics and population, calculating the number of people that may survive in ecosystems without exceeding a carrying capacity. Or, romanticizing the predicaments of indigenous peoples, activists of privilege often reduce these struggles to questions of need and subsistence, perpetuating the myth of the needy primitive who depends on the benevolent assistance of white men. When activists focus solely on questions of ecological need and survival, they fail to recognize the qualitative concerns of poor peoples who also share desires for a meaningful and pleasurable quality of life. In this way, they ignore the fact that most poor people cannot access the things they may desire. A vast number of people in the U.S. cannot afford quality organic produce enjoyed by middle and upper class peoples, nor can they afford the time, cost, equipment, or transportation to take pleasure in the vistas of nature by vacationing in national parks no matter how much they might like to. Each community rich or poor, has its own struggle for quality of life. Activists in Harlem fight for a clean and beautiful neighborhood park for their children to enjoy while also organizing campaigns for clean air. In turn, intrinsic to indigenous struggles for ecological sustainability are attempts to protect meaningful cultural practices that are also threatened by capital-driven poverty and ecological devastation. By reducing the ecological agenda of others to issues of need, ecological activists miss the opportunity to redirect their own desire for an ecological quality of life in a more radical direction. In fact, the desire for an ecological way of life among both poor and privileged peoples carries within it the nascent demand for an ecological society a demand that has potentially revolutionary implications. 4. Once we collectively translate this desire into political terms, we are able to challenge a global system that immiserates most of the world's inhabitants, forcing them to forego their desires lowering their ecological expectations to the level of mere survival. Keeping a desire focus within the ecology movement keeps our demand for satisfaction, vitality, and meaning alive, invigorating our ability to envision a socially and ecologically desirable society. What is more, a needs-focused agenda directs our attention away from the qualitative dimensions of everyday life that are so crucial to ecology. Ecological activists need not repeat the same errors committed by the old left which emphasized issues of quantitative need over matters of qualitative desire. Marx believed that a universal condition of material need caused all social strife and injustice. Accordingly Marx asserted that after material inequity was abolished through the revolutionary process, social relations would be automatically improved, restoring quality of life to realms outside of labor as well. Marx could not have anticipated the degree to which capitalism would invade and erode the realm of home and the everyday in the post-war era. Again, for Marx, it was primarily the sphere of work that was poisoned with alienation, and it was there that he placed the locus of his theory. The 60s brought a needed challenge to Marxist theory. Groups such as the Situationists in France, as well as sectors of the American New Left expanded their focus to address the encroachment of capitalism into everyday life. The New Left's emphasis on such qualitative domains as sensuality art, and nature stood as a response to Emma Goldman's apocryphal warning to Marxists decades before, if I can't dance, in your revolution, I'm not coming. As these movements illustrated, a focus on desire keeps our eyes on the qualitative dimension of life. It allows us to attend to the ways in which the process of commodification extends into our relationships with each other and with the natural world, reducing parents to child care providers, the sick to consumers of health care, and nature to patentable genetic material. A focus on desire offers us a way to counter this emptiness with a desire for a qualitatively new world of our own making. Finally focusing solely on need and survival naturalizes conditions of ecological scarcity and destruction. When we lose sight of the qualitative dimensions of life, we lose the ability to contrast the world that is to the world that ought to be. 
we lose the ability to see and name the very institutions that prevent society from becoming the desirable creation that it ought to become. Paradoxically focusing on desire allows us to expose the social mechanisms that produce conditions of scarcity. Such a focus reveals the true solution to the ecological division of labor, to challenge the political and economic institutions that force the world's majority to struggle to satisfy basic ecological and social needs. Clearly this challenge would entail a politicization of an ecology predicated on a redefinition of need and desire as well as a transformation of economic and political power. Not only would we have to rethink the quality of our needs and desires but we would have to explore new ways to meet them within new social and political institutions. Nature and Desire, Toward a New Understanding As the contemporary ecology movement approaches the end of its third decade, the ecological division of labor remains intact. What impedes ecology from fulfilling its potential to transform institutions that fabricate social and ecological need in the first place? Certainly a primary cause of the ecological division of labor is a global hierarchical system of political and economic power which benefits the privileged who, in turn, keep the system in place. Yet, in addition to this problem of social hierarchy there is also a crucial issue regarding how privileged peoples within advanced capitalist society frame concepts of nature and desire. Ideas about nature and desire stem from centuries of ideology that support existing political and economic structures in the West. To a large extent, we inherit our romantic ideas regarding nature from thinkers of the colonial era. By the 18th century Rousseau became the first in the West to position the category of nature in explicit moral opposition to society describing nature as an exotic, Eden-like state of innocence to which man must emulate. Indeed. The nature we know and love in the West is largely born out of the colonial imagination. It is Diderot's Tahiti where the colonizer fixed his gaze upon an exotic other dwelling in an objectified realm of purity. We have also inherited a Germanic understanding of nature formalized during the 19th century by thinkers such as Ernst Haeckel. For Haeckel, who coined the term ecology in 1867, nature represented a pristine and mystical realm bound to the people of the German nation a wholesome haven which must be protected from exogenous elements. We in the West are the inheritors of such understandings. Our notions of nature are often abstract and romantic, proscribing idealized places and times to protect or return to, rather than proposing radical social change that could provide the basis for a free and ecological society. Our ideas regarding desire are also highly problematic. As citizens of a liberal capitalist society our desires constitute an amalgam of individualistic, competitive, and acquisitive yearnings. Consequently we tend to see ourselves as individuals destined to compete for scarce resources, striving to fulfill a range of personal desires for sex, wealth, status, or security. Desire is largely viewed as a matter of self-interest expressed within the realms of work, politics, and even love. Informed by a capitalist sensibility, Desire is often reduced to yearnings for an accumulation of private property both material and symbolic. Even matters of spirituality meaning, and aesthetics tend to be translated into quests to acquire personal truth and beauty. Rarely do we view desire as a yearning to enhance a social whole greater than ourselves, a desire to enrich the larger community. When such approaches to nature and desire meet, they give rise to an unfortunate approach to ecology. Combining an individualized and capitalistic notion of desire with an abstract and romanticized understanding of nature, we engender a movement of people who long to return to a more pristine quality of life by consuming artifacts and experiences that they deem natural. Ecology becomes a movement of people who see themselves as individuals and consumers yearning for ecological asylum rather than as part of a social whole that strives to radically transform systems of power. Thus our ideas of nature and desire direct ecological criticism away from social change and toward the protection of a nature to be enjoyed by privileged peoples. This tendency has dismayed social change activists who regard middle-class desires for wilderness preservation and personal lifestyle as being insensitive to the needs and desires of poor people. Yet as we have seen, the question is not whether to focus on ecologically related need or desire, clearly we must address both. The question is what kind of desire will inform the movement and what kind of nature will be the subject of that desire within ecological discussions? 
will it be an individualistic desire for a nature that is understood to be outside of society? Or will it be a social desire, a yearning to be part of a greater collectivity that will challenge the structure of society to create a cooperative and ecological world? I believe social ecology feminism, and social anarchism can help illuminate a definition of desire that is profoundly social, rather than purely romantic or individualistic. This is crucial because while our society offers us a variety of ways to describe the many dimensions of individualistic desire, we are offered a paltry vocabulary with which to describe a social understanding of desire. We are saturated by consumerist rhetoric of personal satisfaction, yet rarely do we hear eloquent discussion regarding the cooperative impulse or regarding the craving for a free and non-hierarchical society. Instead, our society worships at the fountain of capitalism whose insatiable waters of material greed and sexual domination crowd out the opportunity to cultivate a desire to regenerate rather than deplete cooperative social and ecological relationships. Yet while there is little talk of social desire within the domain of liberal capitalism, it continues to speak its own name within many social movements. Within social anarchist movements of the old left and the more recent movements of the new left, there exists an implicit understanding of both the complex needs and desires which people bring to the revolutionary project. Activists in the civil rights, women's liberation, gay and lesbian liberation, ecology and anti-war movements fight to recreate social life from a qualitative perspective in addition to opposing material inequality in society. Indeed, the feminist and ecological movements are compelling illustrations of desirous movements. Radical feminists of the 60s and 70s demanded more than to merely survive male violence and sexual inequality, they also addressed a wide spectrum of aesthetic, sexual, and relational concerns. Similarly the ecology movement of the 70s and early 80s wanted more than to stem ecological destruction. The Back to the Land movement crystallized a desire for a more healthful and sensual expression of everyday life. In turn, the civil rights movement embodied a sensual impulse in its plea for brotherhood between the races expressed in Martin Luther King's speech, I Have a Dream. King's speech represents one of the most passionate and poetic in history, giving voice to the collective desire of the African American community not just for political and economic equality but for a particular quality of life infused with dignity, beauty, and cultural integrity. Civil rights activists sought to awaken a sensibility based on mutual respect and a reclamation of collective cultural self-love. Even within movements driven primarily by material scarcity a dimension of desire plays a vital role. Among the anarchists in the Spanish Civil War were peasants who fought not merely for an allotment of bread, but for a spectrum of social and moral freedoms as well. What made their struggle different from communist sectors within the old left was their demand for beauty pleasure and collectivity as well as access to food, land, and control of the means of production. Film footage of this revolution reveals the dual nature of the struggle, while revolutionaries risked their lives in combat, they also, in the process, converted luxury hotels previously owned by the rich into halls in which everyone could eat, drink, dance, and enjoy if for only a moment, the quality of life for which they were willing to die. This book represents an attempt to begin to rethink our notions of desire in the hope of radicalizing our approach to ecological questions. It emerges out of the belief that ecology should not be reduced solely to issues of physical need and survival, but should also embrace the desire for an improved quality of everyday life that can only be achieved through a profound transformation of social, economic, and political institutions. It also represents an attempt to reconsider our understandings of nature by challenging romantic and dualistic assumptions that underlie notions of what constitutes ecological change. The ecology of everyday life brings together some of the ideas I have grappled with during the years 1984 to 1998. These chapters were written from within the movements in which I traveled as an activist and a teacher movements ranging from the Greens and eco-feminist movements to the anarchist movements that have re-emerged in recent years. The ideas presented here were developed during a time in which activists in these movements were rethinking such basic categories as nature, desire, identity, and politics, reaching for more nuanced and complex understandings of questions of power related to social and ecological questions. These ideas also emerged from my work as a psychotherapist and social worker. For over a decade, I worked with a range of people, poor and privileged, 
developing an appreciation for the everyday struggles that people endure as they search for meaning, community and pleasure in a world that is often alienating and disempowering. Through this work, I began to understand the enormous burdens and joys that people bring to ecology, I began to appreciate both the personal and political sources of their hopes and dreams for a better world. Coming of age in a greater New York suburb in the 70s, and raised in a conservative middle-class Jewish family my own voyage to feminism, social ecology and social anarchism has been complicated indeed. The nature I knew was an acre of woods behind my elementary school, politics was Richard Nixon and the Cold War, and feminism was the white businesswoman standing proud with her briefcase on the cover of Miss Magazine. This book reflects my attempt to understand the origins of my own dreams and assumptions about society and nature, as well as my ongoing struggle to articulate new ways of thinking about social and ecological change. The radical ecologists I address and critique in these chapters are my friends, fellow activists, students and myself, as I, too, continue to work to transcend the epistemological and institutional constraints this society imposes upon a world we are all trying so desperately to transform. Throughout the 80s and 90s, I recognized a need for privileged people active within such movements to be more critical about the way they approach ecological issues. Focusing on the trials and tribulations within the radical ecology movement, the chapters in Part 1 were written in an attempt to encourage others in the movement to consider the historical and political forces that lead their ecological activism in a romantic or individualistic direction. These chapters treat ecology as a discussion that is constrained by systems of racism, capitalism, sexism, and state power, a discussion in which activists must locate themselves in reference to questions of social privilege and power. I wrote the middle set of chapters in an effort to expand our current vocabulary for discussing desire within progressive movements. Dismayed by what I saw as a reduction of desire to romantic and individualistic terms, I decided to explore the cooperative impulse within social anarchism, feminism and social ecology to uncover a more social expression of desire that I believe draws out a cooperative sensibility within ecological discussion. The second chapter in the section is an exercise in thinking through what it means to be sensual, creative, and dynamic, appealing to the metaphor of the erotic to point to different facets of social desire. I wrote this chapter in response to a tendency among radical ecologists to counterpose questions of intuition and reason or spirituality and rationality. I wanted to explore the possibility of transcending this dualism by using a different metaphor for conveying deeply meaningful social and ecological experiences that are marked by both emotion and rationality. Finally the last section brings together the idea of social desire with a new understanding of nature drawn from social ecology. Positing desire as social, and nature as natural evolution, I explore a social desire for nature a desire to create cooperative social and political structures to establish a society that allows people to participate constructively in natural evolution. To ground an ethics for a social desire for nature, I look to Bookchin's natural philosophy concluding that a rational desire for nature entails the decision to create an ecological society based on direct democracy. Finally I explore a framework for thinking through how to enact such a social desire for nature illustrating a way to reflect a broad political and revolutionary vision within particular ecological and social struggles. My purpose is to be both critical and reconstructive, illustrating limitations in our ecological thinking while offering insight into how to transcend those constraints by creating a more radical understanding of both nature and desire. I have come to believe that it is crucial for society to become aware of the ways in which ecological ideas are informed by qualitative questions of desire and longing a desire that must be approached in a social rather than individualistic direction if true political transformation is to occur. To challenge previous ecological thinking is not merely a matter of arguing that the approaches taken by radical ecologists have been politically biased or socially constructed. What is necessary is not to criticize previous thinking for being a product of history, but to understand the historical processes which have produced such thinking in order to create new ways of conceptualizing ecological change. A critical discussion of ecological thinking is particularly crucial today because as I have just mentioned, a major tendency in the U.S. ecology movement has been to polarize questions of reason and emotion so that ecological yearning for such ideas as wilderness, community, 
or animal liberation are often understood as lying outside the domain of rational reflection and discourse. Too often, ecology has become a thing to feel rather than a thing to think as well. In this book, I have tried to transcend this binary between thinking and feeling to create an understanding of informed desire. I believe that we do not degrade the integrity of our desires be they spiritual or aesthetic, by understanding their origins and implications. I also believe that our thinking is of little value if our thoughts do not move us to take compassionate and political action to improve the lives of other people and of the planet. Ultimately I believe that a desire informed by an appreciation of history, politics and ethics can help us to look critically and passionately at how to solve the social and ecological problems that we face today. Of the many thinkers I have read, there are four who, for me, most exemplify the ability to synthesize reason and passion. For each of these thinkers, there is one work that inspired me to write this book, first, Post-Scarcity Anarchism by Murray Bookchin, second, an essay written by Audre Lorde called The Uses of the Erotic, The Erotic as Power, third, the chapter The First Bond in Jessica Benjamin's book The Bonds of Love, and fourth, a short poetic essay by James Baldwin entitled The Creative Process. Note. I am indebted to these writers for inspiration and direction. While I have drawn inspiration from many of these writers' works, the pieces mentioned here represent for me particularly important sources for new ways of thinking about desire. See Murray Bookchin, Post-Scarcity Anarchism, 1969, reprinted by Montreal, Black Rose Books, 1986, Audre Lorde, Uses of the Erotic, The Erotic as Power, in Sister Outsider, New York, The Crossing Press, 1984, Jessica Benjamin, The First Bond, in The Bonds of Love, Psychoanalysts, Feminism and the Problem of Domination, New York, Pantheon Books, 1988, James Baldwin, The Creative Process, in The Price of the Ticket, Collected Nonfiction 1948-1985, New York, St. Martin's, 1985. I cannot help but include a quote from this last essay of Baldwin, who I hope, would forgive me for modifying the pronouns, societies never know it, but the war of an artist with society is a lover's war, and the artist does, at best, what lovers do, which is to reveal the beloved to themselves and, with that revelation, to make freedom real. End note. I point to these pieces as a way to illustrate the sources of a few of the many threads I have knitted together in an attempt to develop a new understanding of the desire for nature. I am teetering on the shoulders of these great thinkers, one a natural and political philosopher, one a feminist poet and theorist, another a feminist psychoanalytic theorist, and yet another, a novelist and essayist, trying to perhaps bring together pieces of myself that I can in turn integrate toward a new understanding of the questions I pose in this text. As a poet, psychologist, social ecologist, and feminist, I have tried over the years to consider the social and political conditions that are necessary to allow all people to express their desire or creativity in ways that will make the world a more interesting, ethical, and pleasurable place. I offer this book as a reflection on how to draw from a variety of sources, both reasoned and impassioned, to think about how to create a more desirable and ecological world. It is my belief that desire fleshes out the revolutionary project, inciting us to expect more than that which we need, enlivening us to demand the fullness of social and ecological life, in all of its passionate complexity.